Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Desern, for that very timely talk. All of us obviously are grappling with this, especially as many of us are in hot spots uh, for COVID uh, ongoing. So we're going to redo uh, Dr. Desern's poll and see uh, what you guys learned from her talk. So if you can get out your, uh, get ready to select your answer. To what degree can transfusion thresholds be altered in anemic patients with MDS safely during this pandemic? Select one of the following. Transfusions cannot be safely altered. Increase to a hemoglobin trigger to 10 grams as red blood cells are protective. Decrease the transfusion trigger to 8 grams per deciliter. Decrease the transfusion trigger to 7.5 grams per deciliter. Or decrease the transfusion trigger to 7 grams per deciliter. So please select your answer. The correct answer will come into the chat uh, briefly after the poll closes. And for those of you who get done early, please uh, enter any questions as we'll have a little bit of extra time for this session to discuss uh, all of the things that we need to talk about with this pandemic. Fantastic. All right, so let's get started with questions. So uh, Dr. Desern, Dr. Rafael Behar has a first question for you. Um, he is asking, how do you think our adaptations uh, to this pandemic will continue once we're no longer sequestering? What things would you fight to keep? What things do you think are, are gonna be uh, helpful to our field? That's a great question. I really spent some time thinking about it and tried to allude early on to a couple of issues. I think um, certainly managing resources has always been important, but it's been brought to the forefront and we'll continue to do that for things like transfusional support. I also, you may all come from centers where you had a drive through shot clinic, but it actually seems very obvious and it's something we had never had and our patients adore it. It's efficient, it's safe, I still see them by telemedicine, but we continue their comprehensive care with just some nuances. And I think things like that will continue. I also have patients who I've cared for for years who were unwilling to get the flu vaccination, who finally were willing to receive it this year and realized that it's not bad. <laughs> and so I think there's other things like that with some preventative health initiatives that we'll understand. And then from a scientific perspective, I gave that talk a while back, but there was some recent, um, a letter in the New England Journal about how long COVID is shed, and specifically in um, patients who are immunosuppressed, post-transplant, CAR T, lymphoma, and I think really studying things in immunosuppressed patients, possibly like myelodysplastic syndrome, is going to become a bigger part of science. How we respond to vaccines and things like that will be very useful going forward to have that knowledge from the scientific side. Great. Maybe along those lines, then, we have a question um, from Dr. Philip Perriman. What criteria are you using for COVID positivity, especially in the context of retesting? We here continue to use an RNA-based test. And something that's been um, quite controversial is what to do with the antibody testing, which we also have. It's been an evolving and complicated algorithm here in very good consultation with our infectious disease colleagues, but I struggled to give you a direct cutoff. And I just used that first case to show you how long our patients shed, and that's actually recapitulated in the scientific article for the letter I mentioned earlier this week um, in the New England Journal. And I think this is something that we're struggling with, that possibly these patients do shed longer, and that still is considered a positive RNA test. So I know that doesn't exactly answer your question, but it's really becoming complicated. Right, our hospital, the same thing. We now have a new designation of 20 to 90 days post COVID positivity, and we don't tend to resample them just because they are positive and are having extra precautions during those time periods too. I don't know, Dr. Consola, if you have other experiences from your, your center. Not unfortunately. All right. Um, what are you going to recommend about the COVID vaccination? If, when, and if uh, that is available, how are you are you going to recommend that to your MDS patients? And do you guys already have anything in the planning phases at your center? Such an important question, and I feel like I get three to four times a day from clinic <laughs> patients, and I struggle with how to answer because the short 
true answer is this is a vaccination that wasn't necessarily studied in this age group nor in patients who are immunosuppressed. And so we will have to do this based um, on expert opinion, availability, and individual patients. I think practically speaking at the bedside to use very similar vaccination recommendations to the flu probably makes some degree of sense. I certainly don't intend to withhold the vaccination from patients who feel strongly about it, but I will talk to them in their context of their degree of immunosuppression and likelihood of actually being able to make antibodies and find it useful. We just don't know. We need more data is the real answer though. Great. Um, and how have you been uh, thinking about or incorporating oral hypomethylating agents? You mentioned them in your talk, and I think obviously in this context where people are trying to avoid coming to the medical center, um, those make sense more now than ever. Um, and so I'm wondering how you're incorporating those. So the oral hypomethylating agent I was referring to is brand name is Encovi. Um, it's oral decidabine, and it was approved in late August. To be honest, um, the availability of it didn't necessarily happen the morning after the FDA approval, and so I've been slow to adapt it. I have had a couple of patients um, who had stable responses on standard hypomethylating agent therapy who chose to switch. My personal practice has actually not been to switch everybody and probably will not be given we still have other ways to keep them safe on regimens they were working. In terms of new initiation, I offer it now in patients who meet the label for higher risk disease as one of the potential therapeutic options they have. Great. Um, Dr. Dan Weisman is asking, have you found yourself deferring many higher risk patients from embarking on hypomethylating agents if they're not transfusion dependent and generally well? trying to balance that hard risk of transformation versus extra risk from COVID? It's a great question and one we all grapple with. I will own, I'm usually a treater. Um, that has been my nature historically throughout my career, but I've had very concrete eyes wide open conversations with transfusion independent patients, even who might have blasts and the excess blast one and two ranges where we've tried to hold off as long as we could. Um, to keep them out of the hospital. And I think a lot of it's about expectation management and close surveillance with count checks. And that's how I've managed to hold off people. One, we were able to hold off from about May until early August, and both of us were happy that was about as good as we could do. Great. Dr. Michelle Geddes is asking, would you consider patient self-administration of erythropoietin supporting agents at home? Very practically speaking, yes, I would consider it. I'll just be frank that in the state of Maryland, this is virtually impossible as well as our border states due to insurance regulations. And so it's never been something that I was medically uncomfortable with, but from a practicality standpoint, hasn't been a reality in my patient population. Great. All right, Dr. Moshe Middleman is asking, do you experience a shift of patients from the hospital to outpatient and community? It's been interesting. I like to think we've always maintained really good back and forth with our community partners here, but it's been interesting. And I think different places, depending on the rates of COVID, a lot of the community sites have had unique paradigms to protect the patients where they might be open one week, but not open the next week, or providers were working shifts at a week at a time. And so the patient wasn't continually seeing their oncologist. And so it's been quite patient to patient that if we could have them treated in the community in a way that made sense for the medical issues and continuity of care, everybody was happy with that. Um, Actually, the first patient I mentioned had always been treated in the community, but there was no capacity to manage her COVID positivity in a bit of a smaller center. And so that definitely needed to stay more in our center. And so I think it's been, again, patient by patient. Great. Dr. Rivera Ferenbrook is asking what medications you're administering in your shot clinic. Uh, practical advice. So in case oh. anyone else wants to get a shot clinic going, they can uh, think about which ones to put in their list. 
Yeah, so when we stick their arms out, um, the two biggest have been erythropoiesis stimulating agents and actually for the gentlemen who have prostate cancer, um, luprolide or whatever preparation you use. Um, in the list are GCSF, um, that's a little less relevant to the MDS patient population, and then actually loose patercept, um, relevant to this patient population as well. Those are the main sort of quick throughputs that we've been successful with. Our center has not had this, but a couple of other area um, hospitals have had blood draw, uh, kind of drive through blood draws, which patients have really liked. So they drive up, put their arm out the window, get their blood drawn, and then they have their counts checked without having to go to a clinic setting. And so I've seen that as well. Um, well, Dr. what's really uh, funny Howard is Go ahead, sorry. No, I was just gonna say they drive through, stick their arm out, their blood gets drawn, they drive around the block, we make sure we know the hemoglobin, and then they stick their arm out for the shot. <laughs> Even better, or they could just have a parking lot, I guess, maybe uh, at Hopkins, you don't have space for very many parking parkers, so <laughs> they have to keep driving around. All right, so Dr. Howard Terabolo is asking, on your patient who is receiving the transfusions at 10-week intervals, uh, how is your iron overload situation, and did, have you managed that differently in the COVID pandemic? Uh, iron chelation is such a good topic in MDS, and there's certainly people on both sides of the fence as to how they manage that. I do favor in patients with transfusional iron overload and ferritins that are in excess of 1,000 or 2,000, um, trying hard to manage with oral iron chelators. Obviously, there's the GI issues and side effects that limit those in some patients. I will tell you, though, I have a number of patients who have historically gotten iron chelators. I'm not sure which preparations you have in your centers, but some of the four and six hour infusions. And I have switched those patients to home care and overnight infusions, which has actually gone shockingly well. And I will continue to do that, back to Dr. Behar's first question. And then there's also some patients who couldn't do that. I didn't want them in the clinic that long. And we've held chelation during the pandemic and I'll resume when appropriate. Great, thank you. So that was uh, all the time we have for questions, but I really appreciate uh, all everybody's con contributions to our lively discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Desern, for that really important uh, presentation. So we're now going to continue on to our next speaker. Dr. Katerina Gotze is gonna be talking about venetoclax in higher risk MDS and AML. And so we will start with her poll question here in just a second. All right, so which answer is false? The combination of venetoclax and azacitidine, please select one of the following, is indicated for AML patients that are ineligible for intensive chemotherapy, rarely induces tumor lysis syndrome, is approved for higher risk MDS, increases myelosuppression compared to azacitidine alone, and improves overall survival versus placebo plus azacitidine in therapy naive AML. All right, fantastic. So now we're going to hear from Dr. Goetze uh, on venetoclax and higher risk MDS and AML. 